Oh, it's summertime, and I know many of you are looking forward to vacation time. So we're going to spend some time this summer encouraging you to get lots of R&R, encouraging you to get lots of rest and relaxation and refreshment, but a certain kind of rest and relaxation and refreshment that will bide you well for years and years and years to come. So hey, let's do a little audience participation. Where do you guys like to vacation? Just shout it out. Where do you like to go on vacation? Bruce Peninsula, at home, by the pool, staycation down here, your bed, okay, interesting, okay, how about at the back, something out of the back row Baptist back there, where, the Bahamas, all right, okay, what do you like to do on vacation, so we've identified some places, what do you like to do when you're on vacation, nothing, Swim, read, campfires, some camping, hiking, tanning, whatever it might be, right? So we, we would all, uh, it's, you seem kind of excited today about the idea of going on vacation. Uh, you, you're, you, you're participating much more than I normally uh, get out of you, which, which says a lot about the kind of crowd that we have here today. Um, you like to chill out, you like to have fun. Well, hey, this is actually a good thing. Uh, people that study even the, the human body tell us that it's a good thing for our bodies to get rest and relaxation. They tell us that it's, it's good for our, our blood pressure, it helps regulate cholesterol levels, it gives us time for our bones and ligaments and muscles to rejuvenate. There's, there's a ton of benefits to vacationing, to getting rest and relaxation and I think part of the reason why we like it is we just come back feeling a little, a little better. Even if we had to pack the van and travel a long distance, there's just something nice about getting away from the routines and uh, doing something different. So lots of benefits attached to that. But one thing that vacations can't solve is spiritual fatigue. Vacations can't solve spiritual fatigue, fatigue or spiritual challenges in and of themselves. In fact, you can actually go away on vacation and still sin. You can go away on vacation and sin more than you otherwise might be sinning. You can go away on vacation and, and spiritually nosedive, come back maybe physically feeling a little more refreshed, but not being in a good place with God. And so uh, the Word of God helps us to see how to take a spiritual vacation, you might say. And that spiritual vacation, you're going to be quite excited about this is not two weeks a year. It's supposed to be 52 weeks of the year. There should be time in our lives uh, every single day when we are investing in our relationship with God. So uh, we're going to do a series of messages this summer when I'm here, because by the way, I, I am going to take some vacation this summer. But when I'm here, I'm going to do a series of messages with you uh, simply called Summer Rest and Relaxation, Psalms that Bring Rest and Relaxation. I'm going to touch down on several psalms in the Bible that will help us to see how do we find refreshment in God? How do we find just spiritual rejuvenation with God and in God? And one of the things, by the way, I like about the psalms is that the psalms read differently than the rest of the Bible. So the whole Bible, all 66 books, is the Word of God, inspired by God, given to us, profitable for teaching, for re reproof, for rebuke, for building up in righteousness so that the man of God might be thoroughly equipped for every good work. So the whole of the Bible is God's word. But if you read the other 65 books of the Bible, the, the trajectory is God speaking to us. God speaking to us. God speaking to us. The interesting thing about the Psalms, which are actually 150 distinct songs, not chapters, but distinct songs, is that they help us to communicate to God. So the rest of the Bible is coming to us like this. The Psalms helps us to learn to communicate up to God. So if we've sinned, the Psalms help us to confess our sin. If we're just filled with thanksgiving, the Psalms model that. If we just want to praise God, the Psalms model that. If we want to cry out to God for judgment upon our enemies, the Psalms model that. The Psalms also teach us how to find rest and rejuvenation in the Lord. They really do. So we're going to go to Psalm 27 today, and um, 
Really what we're going to see here is that gazing on God brings rest and relaxation. In the Psalms, we have this interesting pattern. The pattern is the human, the psalm writer, the nation of Israel, whoever happens to be the, the uh, speaker in the psalm, is experiencing some sort of unrest or imbalance or challenge, and they're feeling disoriented. And in the psalm, they encounter God. And when they encounter God, they experience rest, refreshment, and reorientation to get on with life. So from disorientation to reorientation, from fatigue to refreshment, from feeling tired and worn out to feeling like you've almost been spiritually rebirthed again. That's what we get from the Psalms. And much like you might go out in creation and you're sitting by some beach and you see the sun set, or you get up in the morning and you see the sun rise, there's something about that that just refreshes you. Or you're out in the woods and you see the beauty of the trees and rock escarpments and maybe a stream running through the woods or you see wildlife. It brings refreshment just by being away from the hustle and bustle of city life and being out in creation. That's what God is like, but so much more. When we look at God, there's something about the presence of God, just being in the presence of God that reorients us, that brings us refreshment and joy in our lives. So here's my big idea. God is the ultimate vacation partner. I think that's what the psalm is really pushing us towards. God is the ultimate vacation partner. When you're with him, you will find rest. When you're with him, you will find relaxation and refreshment. So how does my relationship with God refresh me? How does that all work? The psalmist helps us. Here's truth number one. We're going to look at several. Here's number one. He releases us from fear. God releases us from fear. There's something about God that is not true of the rest of us. He has something in his very makeup and being, a capacity beyond any man or woman's capacity to release us from fear. Check it out. Verse 1, Psalm 27. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? Notice fear, afraid. One of the things that is true of all human beings is that we will experience fearful events in life, challenges in life. Maybe the fear of a relationship falling apart or the fear, what if that relationship that is not going so well is never put back together? We'll experience fear in a church like this as we step out and try to do work for God and we will experience resistance. Fearful moments like the doctor calls and says, hey, you know those tests that you had? I need you to come into the office and I need to talk to you about them. Well, can't you just tell me on the phone? No. And immediately you're like, uh-oh, what's going on? The fear of being confronted by your boss at work. The fear of losing your job. The fear of never getting married. The fear of never being gainfully employed. The fear of being persecuted or attacked for your faith. A lot of things in life that can make us afraid. And wouldn't you agree that when fear sets in, there's catastrophic results? One of the things that we notice in our lives when we're afraid is we oftentimes just sort of stall out. We just go passive, self-protective thing. We go passive, we stall out, we stop making decisions, we stop investing in ministry, we stop investing in relationships, just stall out. Or we get angry, start getting angry, we're lashing out at people, we're bitter towards others. And, and while lashing out at people is never excusable, little tip in terms of relationships, when you meet someone that is incessantly angry, you've probably met someone that is always afraid. And their anger toward you, while you might take it personally, is probably symptomatic of some deep-rooted fear in their own lives. And their anger really is a self-protective mechanism to keep people away or to not be abused or to not be vulnerable. 
Fear has all kinds of negative consequences in our lives. And the psalmist here speaks of the, the, the reality of fear. How can I possibly not be afraid? I mean, look at life. Look at how vulnerable I am. Look at all the temptations and challenges. But we do find something out about God here, actually three things about God, which help to mitigate against, actually insulate us from fear. The first one is God is presented as light. Now, what does light do? Light makes everything clear. When the light's turned on in an otherwise dark room, dark campsite, dark garage, dark school, when a light comes on, you can then see everything. And when we are able to see our surroundings, fear drops. God is described here as our light, and that's deliberate. Because God has a way of revealing the truth of our circumstances to us, or being so bright just by his own presence that we just naturally want to look to him and we forget about the challenges and difficulties that are around us. God is our light. And when light shines, everything becomes clear. Secondly, he's described as salvation, meaning that he delivers us from the very source of our fear. God saves us. As evangelical Bible-believing Christians, we often talk about salvation in terms of the moment of our conversion. Hey, were you saved? Yeah, I was saved on, and we named some time in our life. I was saved as a child, as a teenager, as a young adult. I'm, I've been saved. But it's equally true that God is saving us all the time, saving us every day from, from death, from challenge of, we, challenges we've not yet experienced, from the consequences of our own foolishness. God is our light. He makes everything clear, and God is our salvation. He's rescuing us. He's redeeming us. He's saving us from ourselves and from the challenges of life. And third, God is presented to us as a stronghold. I don't know if you've ever had the chance to visit a castle. Uh, we visited a lot of castles a few years back when we were in Ireland, and then we visited some Byzantine castles when we were in Israel many years back. And they're pretty impressive structures. You see them on postcards, but to actually be in them, they're pretty impressive structures. And for a guy that likes to notice how things are built, they're also pretty impressive considering the lack of technology that existed hundreds or even thousands of years ago. But most castles have a place called a stronghold. It could be a tower or an inner room or some part of the building that has extra fortification in it. So if the... the, the the inhabitants of the town that's around the castle or the inhabitants of the castle are being attacked. They might go into the open field and they battle away with their enemy, but if the enemy is overcoming them, they run inside the walls of the castle. If the enemy is trying to breach the walls, then they end up in the stronghold, and strongholds are incredibly difficult to breach. That's a place of sure security. And God here is described as our stronghold. I just find that fascinating. Because you can be in your stronghold, there's still all sorts of wars and battles going on around you, but you're safe. In God's presence doesn't mean there's no battles and difficulties and challenges going on, it just means you're safe. God is described as our stronghold. Like He is our stronghold. He doesn't just provide one, He is our stronghold. So when, when we are in God's presence and we are experiencing fear because of the challenges of life, God comes and makes everything clear. God comes and saves. God becomes our stronghold. Now think about this, brothers and sisters. Think about what things tend to trigger fear in your life. We'll just call them triggers. What are, the, what are your triggers? I'm guessing that there's someone in the room today that would say, oh, it's, it's definitely work stress. I find work incredibly stressful, a lot of responsibility placed on me, long hours, an ornery boss, not enough pay, huge expectations, traveling all over the place, or not getting enough work, or not getting enough hours, or not getting enough pay. Work can be hugely stressful for many of us. Or others might say, oh, it's kids. I mean, are kids not like the greatest blessing and the greatest, I'm not going to say curse. 
challenge? They can be. So they're little, and they keep you up all night. They're highly dependent. Like, oh, if they just get a little bit older, then they start to get rebellious. And then they go through the teen years where they're seeking out their own independence. There's challenges associated with being a Christian parent. You want your kids to grow up. You want them to be better than you. You want them to succeed, but there's challenges there. And it can keep you up at night. I'm sure some of you are going through that even now. Loneliness. It's possible to be in a crowd of people and to be incredibly lonely. I heard a story many, many years ago of a psychiatrist or a counselor that had a man come for counseling and the man said, you know, I'm always lonely, my life is not satisfied, I'm not fulfilled. And, and the, the counselor said, well, there's a, there's, a, there's a circus in town right now and apparently there's a comedian that is just leaving everybody rolling in the aisles and I just, I'm just going to, this is my prescription, go to the, to the circus and listen to the comedian and, you know, give yourself a little bit of a break. And the guy said, well, actually, I am the comedian. <laughs> There's a lot of people that are in crowds of people. They have jobs that involve entertaining others, making other people feel better, but they don't feel good about themselves. Maybe you're not in the kind of relationships you would like. You want to be married, and you're not. You're married, and you wish you weren't because there's more loneliness there than there was in your single days because of the nature of your relational dynamics. Maybe you have some health issues and they're ongoing health issues and that is a huge stressor for you or you're underemployed or unemployed. So here's how it works. Those are the things that are part of life in a broken world. And sorry to say, but you will never get rid of them this side of heaven. Those challenges will come in different shapes and forms, but we will always experience challenges and difficulties that threaten to rob us of our joy. So now we have two options. And think of them as like two lines or two trajectories that you can live your life on. And at the beginning of each is the exact same thing. It's an event or a trigger. So it's, it's the underemployment, it's the lost relationship, it's the singleness, it's the kids, it's the work, whatever it might be. And there's two ways to respond to that. The first way is the most common way. And that is, you choose to believe a lie. You choose to believe a lie. So there's an event, there's a trigger, and you choose to believe a lie. Some of the more common lies include, God is not good. Clearly God has forgotten me. Clearly God has abandoned me. If you think about it, that was actually the very first lie that Satan convinced Eve of. God is not good. He's trying to hold out on you. <laughs> he doesn't want you to eat from that tree because he's trying to rip you off of pleasure. The belief that God is not good can have a huge bearing on people's response. And I'll just say this, church, and I've preached this kind of thing before because I found, find it hugely helpful for my own life. When we talk about beliefs, let's make sure that we're separating out what we say we believe from what we actually believe. I doubt there'd be a Christian in this room that would say God isn't good. You say, oh, God is good. He's presented in the scriptures as good. Of course he's good. But sometimes our actions demonstrate we don't really believe that. If we were writing a doctrinal test in a Bible college and it was like true or false, is God good? True. But do you actually believe God is good? Do you believe he's good through the joys and the sorrows? Or do we just believe he's good when things are great? Do we believe God is good when there's lots of ample provision and then when there's nothing or just when there's ample provision? One of the lies that Satan continues to want to convince us of is that God is not good. He's not out for you. He's not on your side. He doesn't keep his promises. Be aware of that. You get, a response, you get a situation in life, that's a temptation. Another one which flows out of it is I'm not loved. I'm not loved or I'm not lovable. A lot of people, even in our churches, they don't really believe that they are loved. 
And generally what happens is we go back in time and we identify some person or some group of people, often people that are close to us, mothers, fathers, brothers, sisters, babysitters, pastors, someone that was close to us that should have loved us and didn't. And because that person didn't love us, we then allow our lives to be overcome with lack of vulnerability, shame, doubt, and we project that person's weaknesses upon all of the relationships that we live in and we spend the rest of our lives really not, not really believing that we are loved. Again, oh, we'd say we are, but we don't really believe we are. That's a lie. It's a lie from the pit of hell. God isn't good. I am not loved. How about this one? There's no point to life. There's no purpose. I, I feel like the writer of Ecclesiastes tried everything, and it's all meaningless. So I'm just going to sit on my hands. I'm just going to bump along. I'm just going to try to get through the day. Talk to people. What are you doing today? Nothing. What are you doing tomorrow? Nothing. They're despairing. They feel hopeless. Or how about this lie? Pain must be punishment. Pain is punishment. The scriptures present us with a different view of pain. But when we go through pain in life, it's easy to think, well, I, I must be being punished by God or punished for my past deeds or whatever it might be. And there's many others, but brothers and sisters, the point is this. We experience an event, a trigger. And then we choose to believe a lie. And that lie then necessarily becomes fear. Fear. And fear always cripples and always damages us. And in fact, I'll say this to you. If you have fear in your life, it's always because you believe some lie from the pit of hell. It's always traceable back to a lie. It might be a different. It might be God's not good. I'm not lovable. There is no purpose. Pain is a punishment. Or any un other number of lies. But when we experience fear, I, I, I'm, I'm afraid. I'm not talking about fear because a grizzly bear is running at you. I'm not talking about physical fear, like a natural desire to stay away from a ball of fire or a grenade that's about to explode or a car that's about to knock you off your feet. I'm talking about being spiritually crippled by fear. When we experience fear, it's always because we've chosen to believe a lie. And that lie then sets in and that fear then sets in and damages us. And by the way, God receives no glory in all of that. So that's trajectory number one. And that's where most people are in this world, and many Christians find themselves as well. But there's another option available to us. We experience the event. It might be the same event as everyone else. But we choose to overcome the lie by believing truth. Something about God or God's plans, or God's purposes for our lives help us to overcome that truth. And in this particular passage, it's God is light, God is salvation, God is our stronghold. Those are truths. Those truths need to go beyond the brain, just between my two ears. Those truths need to be allowed to saturate my emotional responses to the events of life, my verbal responses to the events of life. My peace, my calm, my, my character, my disposition. We don't just preach truth here to make sure that you get it right intellectually. Truth is meant to transform us, body, soul, mind, spirit, from the inside out. And when that lie then is overcome by truth, we can live fearless lives and then God gets the glory for it, which makes it worthwhile. God honoring? What is it about God that helps me to overcome? What truths do I need to grab hold of? God is above our circumstances. God is untouchable by our circumstances. He's the ultimate overcomer. And when we allow God to come up close and be our ever-present help in time of trouble... He becomes that light and that salvation and that stronghold that we so desperately need. So who, who among us can say, I'm not afraid? 
The man or woman that can say that is demonstrating that they've chosen to believe what God's word has said. And if we are saying, well, I still am afraid, the solution is to draw closer to the Lord and experience God for who he truly is. So he rids us of fear. Second thing God does, he increases our optimism. This is really about our outlook. Optimism really is about our outlook on the final outcome of the circumstance we find ourselves in. Verse 2 says, when evildoers assail me and eat up my flesh. How's that for some disturbing language? Eat up my flesh, my adversaries and foes. Check this out. Look at the confidence here. It is they who stumble and fall. Actually, if you look at verses 1 to 6 of this psalm, you'll find the following words. Evildoers, adversaries, foes, army, war, enemies. Some of them are repeated. Those words are, are meant to kind of overwhelm you with the fact that life is not safe. Life is not safe. It is a dangerous world. To be born is to be hurt. To be born is to be vulnerable. To be born is to be challenged. We've all experienced challenges in life, different challenges. But we all have our own unique challenges and difficulties that we've experienced in our lives. And those challenges can very, very much hurt us, deeply hurt us. How can they hurt us? The Bible uses the words, they assail me, they eat you, they harm you. Their effect is real. There are so many dangers. Like, where do I turn? Check it out again. When evildoers, evildoers assail me to eat up my flesh, my adversaries and foes, it is they who stumble and fall. Notice like the confidence, the hope, the certainty, the optimism that this psalmist had. Why? Because he'd encountered God. How many times have we heard stories, testimonies, or heard it ourselves where someone's going through a painful event in life and they want to know why? Why is this happening? Why am I going through this? Why am I experiencing this challenge? Why is God allowing bad things to happen to an otherwise righteous person? And then in that process, they look up and they gaze upon the Lord and they have an encounter with God. And then they don't even care about the answer to the question anymore. Somehow the very presence of God is enough to satisfy and reorient them in the midst of their disorientation or bring rest to their fatigue. Because they've encountered the God who brings light. They've encountered the God that brings salvation. They've encountered the God who is their stronghold. He has become real to them. And this optimistic outlook is something that's actually woven through the fabric of the whole of scriptures. So if you go way down to the book of Revelation, which tells us how it's going to be in the end, which predicts and prophesies how the story finally comes to a, to a conclusion, it speaks there of God's ultimate victory over evil. And the Bible says, and the great dragon, that is Satan, was thrown down, that ancient serpent, who is called the devil and Satan the deceiver of the whole world. He was thrown down to the earth and his angels were thrown down with him. That's Revelation 12, 9. And it reminds us that in the end, God wins. Of course he does. He's God. Oh, I wasn't quite sure if he was gonna. My circumstances were a little rough. No, he's gonna win. No matter how bad or bad off the world gets, God always wins. And so we have this really summons to adopt an optimistic, hope-filled view of life. If you've ever played team sports, you know that part of your success is in your skills, and part of your success is in your coaching staff, but part of your success is also very much in your attitude. So if you got the team in the locker room, they're like, we suck, we're not going to win, we're terrible, those guys are going to beat the snot out of us. They're probably not going to win. 
But if their mindset is, we can take these guys, we can win, let's get out there and get the job done, you ready guys? They're going to do a whole lot better on the field or the rink. Optimism, being hope-filled, always leads to a better game. Pessimists, they lose. When I was a little kid, I went to a church that uh, taught us a lot of songs. We used to do a lot of singing. Now, it was an interesting church. There was no instruments allowed in the church. So this little thingamabob over here called the drums, that's what the devil played. And we didn't allow musical instruments in our church, but we did sing a lot. And many of the songs that we sang were really good songs. So I, I, I remember this one song, and I, I, I looked it up, and I just want to kind of read. I can read it or sing it. Sing it, okay. So read, sing it. Okay. So it's called Open Up Your Heart, 19, written in 1954. And it goes like this. So let the sun shine in, face it with a grin. Smilers never lose, and frowners never win. So let the sun shine in, face it with a grin. Open up your heart and let the sun shine in. So there you go. Aren't you glad you listen to me singing on that? Okay. There's the pessimist. He didn't believe in me. But if you, if you think about this song, it, it talks about sunshine, and the sunshine is God. He's the light. Same imagery as we find in the Psalms. And I love the line, smilers never lose and frowners never win. Now, this is not just talking about your physical expression. This is talking about your heart attitude toward God. That when you have this certainty, this optimism, that God really is still in control. He really is light, and he's salvation, he's my stronghold. Folks, it puts a whole new perspective on life. It really does. And here's the thing. To believe anything less is to actually disbelieve God and his promises. And what do we call that? It starts with an S, and it ends with in. That's sin. We're disbelieving God, or we're disbelieving God's promises. But God in his grace rids us from fear, and God in his grace allows us to have an optimistic outlook. I, I know how this all ends. Right now it might hurt, but I know how this ends, and it's going to be a good ending for those that are righteous and love the Lord. Okay, here's the third one. He infuses our hearts with confidence. So this is the heart thing. Uh, verse 3 says, uh, though an enemy, an army encamp against me. So think of an army. That's a pretty big group of people. They're encamping. They're like waiting. They're, they're, they've staked out their territory. Though an army encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. The war arise against me, yet I will be, what's the next word? I will be confident. How can you be confident? There's an enemy outside there. I'm still confident. Because I've come to know the God of scriptures. How can, how can you not be afraid? I mean, war is scary. I've been watching this documentary on Vietnam on Netflix. I don't know if you've seen it. It's 2017. It's pretty new. And I've finished off two or three episodes. And uh, one of the soldiers says that when he landed in the late 60s in Vietnam, he, he was shocked how beautiful the country was. The people were beautiful. He said, these girls that came to sing for them, they look like angels. And there's these beautiful blue mountains in the background, and it's all green, and there's these nice rice paddies and these picturesque vi villages and nice warm temperature. It was a beautiful place. But in the midst of all that beauty, then they go to war. And another soldier says, it, it, I was so afraid when I was walking through the jungles of this otherwise Shangri-La-like place. Like every single foot, I was afraid afraid to put every single foot down because it could be my very last. War is not pretty. War, war takes, there could be beauty around you, but when there's war, I'm not even seeing it anymore. I'm just scared to death that this could be my very last day. And on a spiritual level, hey, been there, done that, experienced that. 
where I, I'm terrified of life's circumstances. I don't, I don't know how it's going to work out. I don't know how we're ever going to get through this. But then we have God nearby. And the psalmist is able to say, oh yeah, there's, there's armies all around me. Aren't you afraid? No. I will be confident. I will have a fearless heart. And that confident, fearless heart is only possible when we choose to put our faith in God. When we take our eyes off of the surroundings and we just look up. See, if you don't have that relationship with God, you can't look up. You're just, all you have, your only option is to look around, and it's not a good scene. But when you have God in your life, then even in the midst of the fray, the battle, you can always look up, and there he is. And his presence brings a satisfaction unlike anything else. He's confident, and he has a fearless heart, so can you. To draw close to the Lord, of course, means that we avail ourselves of the spiritual disciplines of Scripture. God is omnipresent, but he manifests himself to us through the practice of spiritual disciplines. And some of those disciplines include being in church. You were created for community. And when God called you to be his son or daughter, he did not call you to be a lone ranger Christian out there blazing your own trail, doing your own thing, fighting your own fights. God didn't call you to go find yourself on some island just hanging, just you and Jesus hanging out. Enjoying. A lot of Christians have this mindset. They are so independent that they're actually sinning. They're, they're ripping themselves off of the one another's of Scripture. They're ripping themselves off of the opportunity to be blessed by other people's giftedness. We are called to community. And that's why the Bible warns in Hebrews 10.25, do not forsake the gathering together of believers as some are in the habit of doing. So we band together as brothers and sisters in Christ. Part of being a growing Christian is being part of a local church community. And that's a discipline. It means I gotta get up, I gotta put my shoes on, I gotta get the kids or start the car, and I gotta drive to church and participate in the life of my church. It means we need to be in God's word all the time. In God's word all the time. What does God's word do? Pushes out the lies. Because I'm getting lies whispered in my ear all the time. News, media, social media, things I see, things people say. I may not even be aware of it, but I'm always getting lies whispered in my ear. And I open the word of God and the lies just pushes them out. They're replaced with truth. Prayer. Time alone with the Lord or in groups calling upon God to do what only God can do, primarily to manifest his presence. Sharing our faith, being evangelistic. Hey, there's nothing that brings your faith to life more than sit, looking someone in the eye who's an agnostic, a skeptic, an atheist, an unbeliever, and saying, let me tell you about the gospel of Jesus Christ. There's no sleepy evangelist, I can tell you that. I mean, it's all eight cylinders are running. These are the things that help us to experience the presence of God in our lives and to grow. So I have a question for you. It's not theoretical. It's a very real question, and it requires you to be honest with yourself and somewhat introspective. You ready for it? The question is very simply, what is your greatest desire? What is your greatest desire? Small that over. What is my, what is my greatest desire? desire. Be honest. It might be one of the following things. My greatest desire is I want to be liked. My greatest desire is I want to be followed. My greatest desire is I want to be kissed. My greatest desire is I want to be rich. My greatest desire is I want people to to look up to me and respect me. My greatest desire is to be beautiful. My greatest desire is to be smart. My greatest desire is to travel the world. What's your greatest desire? Just be honest with yourself. You don't need to tell me or anyone else, but what would you say is your greatest desire? 
the scriptures and life itself teach us that all of these things, and few of them are bad in and of themselves, but all of these things falsely promote themselves as being better than they actually are. Falsely promote themselves as being more competent than they actually are. I mean, they, they are the equivalent of a kindergarten teacher trying to teach physics to PhD students. You can be a really smart kindergartner. You're just simply not competent to provide that level of knowledge to people studying on that level. And everything in this world, it's incompetent. It, it just doesn't even have the capacity to provide what you think it can provide for you which is peace and enjoyment and calm and perspective. And yet, sadly, history is littered with people who have spent their entire lives and fortunes pursuing these things to no avail. And then the next generation comes along and does the exact same dumb thing. But they don't provide. But well, look at this. Look where the psalmist takes us. What a powerful lesson. Verse 4. What is his request? What is his desire? One thing have I asked of the Lord. I've asked it that I will seek after. It's not just putting it into words. He's, he's after this. That I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord. Wow. And to inquire in his temple. I love the, the singular focus of this scriptural passage. One singular request. You got one thing. What are you going to ask of God? One thing I have asked, Lord. Not, not many asks. One thing I have asked of the Lord. That I may gaze upon the beauty of the Lord. Isn't that an incredible, convicting, and encouraging challenge for us? The singularity of it, and yet I ask myself, how many times have I asked of the Lord, made asks of God, and been disappointed? Okay, so, anybody beside me ever asked God for anything and didn't get it? All the time, right? I asked for it, didn't get it. I thought God was a God of promises. I thought he was a promise keeper. I thought he wants to provide for his people. Okay, check this out. Matthew 7, 7, right? Ask and you shall receive. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be open. You said that, God. I asked. I saw it. I knocked. I don't have it. You said you would. In fact, that passage goes on to say, if a father has a child come to him and the child says, Daddy, I need some bread, I'm hungry. What kind of a sadistic father would give their child a stone? If a child comes and says, Daddy, I'm hungry, I, I need a fish. What kind of a sadistic father would give their child a snake? They would never do that. A, child would always, a father would always feed and nurture his child. And that's in that context of ask, seek, knock. God is a good father. So when you ask, you get. When you seek, you find. When you knock, the door will be opened unto you. And then we're like, well, wow, God says it in his word. So I asked, why didn't I get it? Well, God knows our deepest motives. And to the Christian that has asked for something from God, but really they're asking for something to replace God or that might stand in the way of that singular focus upon God, God will often say, no, not yet. And yet the other is also true. I've met Christian after Christian who said, you know what? I asked, I asked, I asked, I didn't get, and then I realized I actually don't need it. I just needed more of God. And then when I 
focused on God, God gave it to me anyway. I know of Christians, young people, middle-aged people, they want to be married. Like, I want to be married. I've asked, I've sought after it, I've, I've knocked at the door, and God hasn't provided a spouse for me. And now I'm starting to wonder, is he really good? Does he really love me? Is he some cosmic killjoy trying to steal my pleasure? Maybe I'll take matters into my own hands. And then they encounter the Lord, and the Lord becomes not just the brother, but also like a spouse to them, and they find satisfaction and contentment in that relationship, and they're no longer desperate for someone to fill their need, and then all of a sudden someone comes along. And their marriage is so much better than it would have been if that person really had become an idol to them. And we could tell story after story, illustrate that in multiple ways. So think about it this way. If God knows that what you're asking for is going to replace him, why would he ever give that to you? I mean, if a husband were receiving flack from his wife, she's like, you're inadequate, you don't measure up. He's like, well, I got a solution. Why don't you find a second husband? Who would ever say that? Or if a husband finds his wife to be inadequate, I don't, you're not doing what good wives are supposed to do, you're, you're not loving, blah, 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 blah. What wife would say, well, maybe you, maybe you should get a second wife? You would never do that. You want to guard the integrity of that exclusive relationship. Why would God ever give us anything that he knows would become our idol, our surrogate God? He just wouldn't do that. So what we need to do is we need to understand motive. When we ask God, we need to ask from a pure heart. When we seek, we need to seek out that which is in accordance with his will. When we ask God, to, you know, I'm knocking on the door, open the door, we need to take advantage of that opportunity to bring glory and honor to him. But if we're seeking after things in life to bring satisfaction to our lives that God alone is qualified and equipped to bring it, God will often say no. And that's the reason why God often does say no. I had a dear brother many years ago say to me with regard to a ministry decision, Aaron, God will give it when you're mature enough to receive it. And I didn't like him saying that. But I knew it was true. And I've seen it come true increasingly in my life. The singular pursuit of the psalmist is he wants to seek, look at the words, he's seeking after God, he wants to dwell with God, and he's gazing upon God. That's the kind of life of intimacy that God wants us to pursue as our most important, central desire. And when we do that, everything else falls into place in accordance with God's will and God's timing. So can you confidently say, in keeping with verse 5, for he will hide me in his shelter in the day of trouble. He will conceal me under the cover of his tent. He will lift me high upon a rock. Are you there? If you're not there, it's because you're, you've drifted from the Lord. But you can be there. You can experience that. It's just the total opposite of fear. He's hiding me in his shelter. He's concealing me in the cover of his tent. He's lifted me high upon a rock. My life is great because my singular focus has been, which overrides all others, is to pursue the Lord and his beauty. God wants us to gaze upon him, church, and to take hold of the fearless, confident, hopeful life that he offers to all who come near to him. We you take up this challenge. I want to leave you with three summer refreshers. Here's three things that I think you should integrate into your schedule this summer in order to give yourself a great summer. You want some spiritual rest and relaxation? We've done different challenges in our church. We've done a read through the Bible in a year challenge a couple times. We did a 8 a.m., 8 p.m. prayer challenge. We did a 1% increase in our giving challenge. We like to do challenges in our church, and it's so exciting to be part of a church where people step up and are blessed by them. I just want to give you a two-month challenge, real short and simple, July and August. Three things that I think you would do well to integrate into your life that will really help you to draw closer to the Lord. Number one, read one psalm every day this summer. Just one psalm. And by the way, there's some psalms that are really, really short. You can read them in like 15 seconds. 
Read one psalm every day. Learn to communicate with God. Learn to pursue God. If you want to read them, read them out loud. And if I could go a step further, read one of them someplace outdoors by a body of water. That'll be really good. It's great to read scripture outside when you're looking at that which God has created. That's challenge number one. One psalm every day, Monday to Friday, Saturday and Sunday alike. Secondly, read a good Christian book. Some of you are great readers. You read a lot. You're reading books all the time, so this is like I'm doing it anyway. Perhaps some of you haven't read a Christian book in a long, long time. So get a Christian book that interests you and read one Christian book over the next seven or eight weeks before summer ends. And just find refreshment in that. And then pray daily. So every day, morning or night, preferably multiple times, com commit yourself, recommit yourself to prayer. And to make it extra fun, do it at least once outside at night on a starry night. Can you do that? Out under the stars, looking up, you're looking up, and you're going to pray to the Lord. You can guarantee it's going to be an awesome experience. So if you can integrate those three things, read a psalm every day, read a Christian book, and pray daily, you are putting yourself in prime territory to encounter and re-experience the presence of God and be refreshed and renewed by Him. Will you do it to bring glory to God? <laughs>